Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Shahab Karni from the studios of Television I-95. And as promised last week, I have a wonderful analyst, Barry O'Connell, with me. And as, as we pre-announced that, Barry, that today we are going to talk about how the citizens of Maryland will be well served by electing people in the General Assembly and the local Senate, you know, how the demographic is changing, the needs are changing, the wishes are changing. So yes. what is your critical analysis? Let's talk about the House of Delegates. Um, the things are moving right now. Go ahead, Barry. Things are going crazy because people are looking to run in particular districts, but they don't know if the district is going to be there or if the district is going to exist by the election time because we just had the census. Now, let me explain. Every 10 years, we hold a census and we count the number of people in Maryland, but we count the number of people by neighborhood, by zip code, by district. We have these numbers and these numbers are changing. Baltimore right now is sure to lose at least one seat, uh, maybe more. Um, at the same time, Baltimore County is very likely to pick up two seats. Um, or two districts, possibly. Um, Prince George's County is going to have, based on the population trends, is going to have another district created in central Prince George's County. That means that these borders are going to be changing. Now, there's something in the law that's very important. A, a Maryland delegate or senator has to live in the same district that they're running in. So whatever district you're in, if the borders change, you could end up either having to move to a different house or run against somebody who used to be your neighbor. It's going to be very confusing and we're not going to know what's going to happen. Now, keep in mind, Governor Hogan really has nothing to do with this. He's got his own commission to look at redistricting and nobody has to pay any attention to anything Hogan says by the constitution. This whole song and dance that he's been putting on is um, basically just a, a dog and pony show. It doesn't have any legal basis. He's gonna make recommendations and then the Maryland General Assembly is going to do very much whatever they want. Period. So what we're going to see is the population is increasing in Democratic areas. Baltimore County, but in the areas that are most likely to be Democratic. Prince George's County in the areas that are most likely to be Democratic. At the same time, uh, we're probably going to see um, a lot of shrinkage in, you know, in... In political terms, we think about that strip down 95, you know, from, from Baltimore County to Howard County, um, then uh, Prince George's and Montgomery, possibly Anne Arundel too. That's the 95 corridor as people term it. That's going to pick up seats because they've picked up population. Baltimore is going to lose seats, but also the so-called red counties are losing seats. So that means that some of these guys are going to find themselves with a district where they're in the same district as somebody who was their colleague in the last session. So that's going to have a big impact. And it makes it really difficult to, you know, to figure out how the challenges are going to be. Now, keep in mind, Bill Ferguson as president of the Senate and Adrian um, Jones as Speaker of the House can do just about anything they want. And the question is, what are they going to do? Take District 10, Speaker Jones's home district. She's never got it along all that well with Delegate Jay Jaleesi. Okay. Um, somebody, and some people said it was her people, were tearing down Jay's signs whenever they were put up on Liberty Road um, uh, in the last election. Um, um, Jay's had cuts to his staff, all sorts of things. There's been contention there. What district is she going to put him in? She could cut a narrow path and gerrymander him into Carroll County. He's close enough to the border. They could sneak him in as a Carroll County delegate. And then at that point, he's going to have a difficult time. Or are they going to leave him in District 10? 
there's a lot of changes coming and we don't know exactly what the speaker is going to do. Bill Ferguson seems more likely not to have an ax to grind against people that he's going to go what's best for his, his people and his people are the democratic senators. Um, now, when we take a look around district 10, we, we need to watch district 10. That's out of the, uh, uh, um, out on the west side of Baltimore County, that's Reistertown, um, uh, Owings Mills, that um, that area. There's good. There's going to be a fight out there. Also, um, District uh, and forgive me, I've got to check my notes on some of these. Whether it's forty. Um, oh, let's talk about forty-four. Uh, forty-four was split into A and B. A is in Baltimore, and forty-four two seats in 44B are in um, uh, Baltimore County. It's virtually certain because of the population decreases that that's going to be a completely Baltimore County district. Now, it's also not going to have any elected incumbents in the race, and that's going to be critical. Nobody, because Patrick Young is, um, is running for county council. He's not going to run for re-election. Um, Charles Sidnor III uh, took the appointment to become senator. Um, good guy. You know, nothing wrong with either of these guys. They're both good guys, but they're not going to be in the race. So suddenly, the two people who were elected to 42B are not running. Okay. Uh, Sheila Ruth is a nice lady, and she got the appointment. At the same time, there was some discord among the ranks, if we can call it that. Some people weren't happy because, because Aisha Khan had run an extremely strong race. She had been a close third in a best of two election. She got passed over for the seat when it came open. Now, she seems to be the favorite right now to um, pick up a seat in what should be a combined 44. Now, that's the problem because we don't know what Jones and Ferguson are going to do because it would be completely possible to either have one district in 44 in Baltimore County, or they could split it into three separate seats and they could end up putting people in the same district. They could do all. Now, back in the days of Senate President Mike Miller and um, um, uh, Speaker Mike Bush, they used to play a lot of games and a lot of times it was gotcha politics. Joan seems more, more respectable, more, I like her. I mean, I, I really like her. And Ferguson is shaping up as a really good Senate president. We don't know what they're going to do. So it could be three separate districts in 44, or it could be one. At that point, Aisha Khan is, is definitely the favorite. Um, uh, Sheila Ruth has done a pretty good job. Aletha McCaskill is a question mark. She ran for Senate last time. She got involved in union politics and Mark McLaurin and Ben Jealous and fights and nobody knows what's going to happen there. You know, she's going to have to run hard if she wants to win that seat. And who is the other woman? There's another Pakistani uh, woman. Uh, Shazia, but there are, there are five women, in fact, in that district. Robin Harvey is one of them. Okay. So her husband, Rainier Harvey, is the political director for Adrian Joan, the speaker, by the way. Yes. So now, um, thank you very much for this area, but I'm sure you have noticed the latest last week's census and the numbers have changed, Barry, and especially we are talking about PG County, Montgomery and Howard. Uh, there are a lot of um, uh, mix or I would say people of color uh, are, are, are in the increase in the rank and file and uh, there are a lot of candidates running, which normally traditionally state of Maryland is not used to of it. So my question to you, Barry, that is this a state, you know, in, in its entirety, uh, I'm talking about the entire state. Are we becoming uh, from right to moderate or to extreme progressive or how do you see? How do you see next cycle in the elections for that matter? One of the problems we have is that some of the some of the extreme progressives are not at all realistic and they go and say and do things that are of questionable value that can even if people generally like their ideas, sometimes the actions of this extreme progressive crowd can turn themselves off. 
Um, you know, like last time, uh, 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 Saria Ben in uh, 40, no, wait a second, um, 34A, I believe. She lost in the primary. Then she ran against um, the Democrats in the fall on a write-in ballot. She, she got around 800 votes, I think. And Steve Johnson almost lost his seat to a Republican because um, – he only won by 200 votes. If she had been a little bit more successful, she could have thrown the seat to to the um, to the Republic. And, you know, it's that sort of. I don't know how to put it. Maybe it's selfish and foolish politics turns people off. So she should be able to get a seat this time, except now they're talking about running her for um, for the open Senate seat in 2034. Um, there's a lot of people who are still shaking their head over what she did um, last time around. Uh, we're going to see um, Baltimore County, um, excuse me, uh, Howard, Howard, Howard County, County um, is going to have a, a fight. Um, the extreme progressives are pushing for a bigger role in Howard County. Um, we've got a guy uh, who is head of the, um, um, uh, uh, the Columbia Democratic Club. You know, he was a Democrat, and he was he was um, he was acting against Calvin Ball because he thought Calvin Ball was too moderate. A lot of people think Calvin Ball's really progressive, but he wasn't progressive enough for Jake Burdett, who who came out against him. Of course, the club shut him down and um, um, took him out of leadership um, over that. But we're going to see these things. The extreme progressives. Some of them are pretty solid people. Um, Richard DeShay Elliott in, in Prince George's County is an extreme progressive, but he's pragmatic and he lacks the arrogance that some of the others show. He also has a deeper political understanding. Um, there's talk, next census, it's very likely that Southern Maryland will pick up its own um, uh, congressional district, uh, but that's good. That's going to be a battle down there all the way through uh, because these these races bleed over into one another. Um, there's a number of progressives running and they've got to fight on. There's also moderate, moderate uh, Democrats. Now, keep in mind, Republicans see them all, all as very liberal, but there's shades of liberalism to where we go with the um, the Bernie Sanders crowd. And we also go with the. Um, the more moderate, reasonable Democrats. So that's that's going to be a battle. It's going to be a big talking battle. about Republicans. What do you think about the Eastern Shore? I mean, I I hear a lot of stories from the Eastern Shore is becoming more, you know, from red to I will say blue or some other shade. You know, I mean, things are changing, and especially when you say when you talk about Wicomico County or neighboring Worcester. What do you think about that? Um. Combination of a few things. The population is shrinking, um, so there's there's less people. So there's going to be less representatives, which is going to uh, pit delegates against each other. Now you have to assume um, that nice woman from Wacomico County, Sample Hughes. I forget her first name. I'm so sorry that I did that. Um, can we assume that Speaker Jones is going to carve out a little extra Democratic niche for her? and not put her against another person? It's probably a safe assumption. Is she going to take some of the Republican delegates and pit them against each other because changing the lines of their districts very likely? Um, that whole area is losing population and it's going to hurt some of, the, some of the Republican legislators. At the same time, what do you do with, um, with District 1? Right now there's talk about extending district because those rural areas are shrinking you have to pick up votes somewhere so some people are talking about the florida district okay what they're saying is it'll look like florida you've got a long panhandle um, that's going to go all the way over well into you know pick up all of carroll county and some votes out that way picking out rural republican votes sliding them into the one that's one possibility the other possibility is that they in 1981, redistricting, they did across the bay. So there's talk about putting um, Charles County, 
St. Mary's, uh, Calvert, perhaps part of Anne Arundel, into the Eastern Shore District. People say, oh, you can't do that. Well, they did it in the Reagan years. That's what the district looked like. It was a very successful district going across the bay. You know, uh, you know the idea is we're not riding by horse and our post doesn't go by the Pony Express. Right now, uh, Carol, uh, Charles County and Wacomico County are similar and have shared interests. They're both rural counties. Um, they could do well in the same district. So that's going to affect some of these legislative races across the board. Good. So it's going to be Good analysis, Barry. Now, my final question to you is really difficult, but I'm sure you will be able to answer that. I hope that for next two cycles, what do you think? What type of general assembly will be better for the state of Maryland citizens, whether extreme, you know, right, left, or moderate, or in the center? What do you think? What is good for the citizens? I would like to see a, a legislature more focused on the needs of the people. And I understand that some areas are going to want a more progressive leadership, such as Prince George's County. It's completely reasonable. Um, on the other hand, there's other places around the state. Montgomery County is going to be a little bit they're going to talk progressive and they're going to vote centrist. That's sort of the way they do things over there. Um, I think we're going to see a mix. And I think that's going to be good for the people. You know, right now we're in a situation where the state has some very serious problems. There are people who were um, who lost their jobs a year ago, filed for unemployment and still haven't gotten their first check. You know, at, we need a strong General Assembly to put pressure on whoever is the governor to be responsive to the needs of the citizens. And we need somebody who can make things work. We don't need, and forgive me for saying so, we don't need a gubernatorial candidate who's worried about national issues. We need a, do, a, a gubernatorial candidate who's going to focus on things like getting people their unemployment. And we need a, a legislature which considers that important. Then we have other people like up uh, um, on the Baltimore County, uh, Carroll County line, we've got people like Nino Mangione who votes no on everything because he figures he can't be blamed for anything if he votes no on everything. Um, I think we're going to see a shakeout of some of the really bad Republicans and we're going to see an increasingly progressive, but hopefully not too progressive, Maryland General Assembly. Excellent, Barry. As usual, good analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really enjoy yes. this. And, this is and of course, you know, in a very short span of time, we have to cover a lot of things, but you are good at that, Barry. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, viewers. That concludes our three series of, you know, first we covered the, the governor's race, then Barry talked about the controller's race, and today we talked about how the citizens of Maryland will be well served, how this General Assembly should be looking for next cycle. So Barry, again, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, coming, I mean, and very soon I will be connecting with you on a very different subject. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Good night. Take care now. Bye bye. Bye.